And so, John, I'm just going to yank the reins away from you for just one moment here uh, while we kind of work, work through some of the logistics. Um, so for those who have just joined us, again, I'm Matt Levitt. I'm an agronomist with Albert Lee Seed here, and this is the 2021 Albert Lee Seed uh, virtual conference on forages. Um, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, next up on the schedule here, we've got a, a farmer slash researcher panel on grazing cover crops, um, both from representation from the upper Midwest, so Minnesota and University of Wisconsin, respectively. Um, and just a couple of logistics uh, for those who are new. Again, apologies for those who have heard me say this four or five times now, but uh, we do want to make this as interactive as possible during the, um, uh, this portion. However, uh, unique to our other presenters, we'd like to try to uh, minimize questions for this particular um, uh, portion until the very end. However, if you have questions, please do type them into the chat and we can review them after both speakers have had a chance to uh, talk about their experiences. So again, how that works. Um, is you uh, type in the chat bar and then make sure you're assigning the question to everyone. And then your question will pop up and myself and my colleague Ashley Bingham will moderate those questions and then ask the presenters. However, in this section, we're gonna hold all questions to the end, but if you do still have questions, please uh, type them in so we don't lose track of them and then we can uh, come back together on those. Um, so Margaret Smith, my colleague, will be kind of joining in here as well on the, um, moderation aspect, uh, but we're going to get started uh, right now with John Lumen from Good Hue, Minnesota, who I think is still joining us from out west. Is that right, John? Are you are you uh, back in, in the cold Midwest now? Oh, sorry. I think you're going to have to unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, I'm in British Columbia now. Oh, okay. All right. Well, very enviable. It's probably rainy and still green there. So sun's actually out today for the first time in many days. So <laughs> nice. outside. great. Well, yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, so you go ahead and share your screen and then you can get started. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm John Lumen, and uh, today we're going to be talking about grazing cover crops. I want to thank Albert Lee Seed House for giving me the opportunity to, I guess, let, <clears throat> tell a little bit about some of the experiences we've had with grazing cover crops. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, this is uh, a picture, I guess, of our farm team, my wife, Terry, my son, Jared, and my daughter-in-law, Val. And we live in Goodyear, Minnesota. We raise about 220 registered Red Angus cattle. Uh, we breed uh, low input grass-based genetics and sell our bulls through Farrell Cattle Company. And uh, we have been raising organic crops since 2001. What I'm gonna talk about today, this is just a rough outline of what I'll be discussing. Uh, why we graze cover crops, uh, how important your farm's context is to deciding which cover crops to raise. And the <clears throat> main part of it will be the three main approaches that we've used to cover crop grazing uh, listed there, which we'll get into in detail, and some additional considerations and lessons that we've learned. So uh, why graze cover crops? I've listed six there. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all six. You can read them uh, on your own. Um, the one I'm gonna just say a little bit more about is the uh, potential cost savings. Uh, I had kind of a light bulb moment <laughs> about two, three years ago. Uh, my son Jared and I were talking about hay production and, and what we should do. And we just calculated out our cost and based on our land rent and the fertilizer value in a bale of hay and the machinery cost, we use Iowa State custom charges to kind of figure out our cost and, and then stand depreciation because no stand of forage, uh, perennial forage lasts forever and you just kind of figured out the cost and it worked out to be about um, $90 a bale or about $158 a ton for us to produce baleage hay. And that might be fine if you're selling dairy quality hay or you need that, but for our beef cows, 
Uh, that's just a pretty high price. And when we figure that we get about 30 to 32 bales or 32 cow days per bale, that works out to about $2.80 a, a day, which is really expensive for a beef cow to be able to, to make a profit if you're feeding hay for six or even seven months a year, like many producers might do in Minnesota. So uh, that was kind of our uh, breakthrough moment that we just realized we really need to push the grazing of cover crops or perennials as much as we can. So uh, context really does matter uh, when you're trying to decide what cover crops to grow or if you should grow any at all. So I'm just going to briefly go through our farm and why we choose to do what we do. Uh, all of our land is highly erodible. Uh, it's very productive, but uh, very erosive. Um, personally, we prefer grassland management and working with livestock over crop farming. Uh, Jared and Val have a, a desire to work into the farm, and I really want that to happen as well. And so we're trying to make a system that will work over the long term. Also, uh, we've been organic farming for 20 years, and giant ragweed has really become a problem to us. And it's very difficult in an organic farm to uh, raise crops with giant ragweed. And we've had good success by using cover crops to help us deal with that weed. I also enjoy experimenting and trying new techniques. And uh, we are cooperative producers for Feral Cattle Company and, and uh, beef production is, is gonna stay uh, for us that we like that better than the crop production. And, and we're always trying to explore lower producing or lower production, cost production. Um, also, we have a desire to improve our lifestyle and our land. And I would have to say after 20 years of uh, farming organically uh, with crops, I didn't really feel like my soils were improving as much as I thought they would. And so we're going to less tillage and grazing really helps us do that. So this is the three main approaches, uh, just kind of shows the outline we're gonna be spending the next couple of minutes over. Our first type of uh, cover crop grazing was uh, after or using winter rye in the fall and grazing it in the spring. Uh, the other approach that we've used is a full season a cool season cover crop and some of the variations we've done there. And finally, we uh, do graze warm season cover crops and uh, primarily stockpiling. So first off is uh, winter rye <clears throat> and we're following that behind either corn or, or beans. We use that to graze uh, yearlings or we've used it to graze our cow calf herd at the calving season. The rye in our area, <clears throat> we're not uh, like out west where it's drier. Uh, things grow really fast and that rye is probably ready about seven to 10 days prior to our cool season perennial pastures. So it's a small window where it's uh, really useful. Uh, when we were calving on it, it worked fine for, it works fine for a little while. Um, when the cows moved into that paddock that you can see the forage, the rye was about uh, 12 to 15 inches tall. And it doesn't take long. I'd say within 10 days, that same rye is probably three feet tall. And one trouble we did have was that the calves uh, will move into, they like to hide. And so they go into the tall rye and uh, it happens quite quickly. And with our registered cattle, we have to weigh them and tag them that first day. And it can be a little challenging when the calves walk into the tall grass and you really can't see them again until they're tall enough to, or when they're old enough to run around and it's hard to catch them. So our second approach is the grazing uh, of cool season cover crops. Uh, we originally, when we started this probably 15 years ago, um, we were doing a complete tillage uh, seedbed and, and establishment, but now we've really gone to more no tilling. And obviously it, it produces less soil erosion. Um, it just leaves better soil structure. And we really like it better, especially in the summer when you're trying to graze that uh, seeding. Um, there might be a 15 or 20% chance of rain and you decide to leave the cows out on that new seeding. But uh, sure enough, you get an inch of rain that night and by the time you get out there in the morning, the cows have uh, pugged it up or muddied it up quite a bit. But with the no-till, that really doesn't seem to be the case. If you have an inch or less rain, uh, it really doesn't affect it very much. So we really like that. Our first experiments with uh, cool season uh, grazing of uh, cover crop 
has been with Italian ryegrass. Uh, it's very high yielding, uh, very high quality. And uh, we, I guess, like that the cows, can, we can stockpile it in the fall. We typically get about three or four grazings or cuttings in that year of establishment. Uh, it is very aggressive and uh, the field or the picture on the left is a picture from this last season. And I believe that was 15 pounds of Italian ryegrass. And then I had quite a bit of other species in there. However, you wouldn't know it because it was primarily uh, Italian ryegrass. If, if the stand is, has enough, and I would say that 15 pounds is, is sufficient to um, kind of hold everything else back. Uh, the first cutting of that was, I would say, primarily giant ragweed uh, because that field has a lot of giant ragweed in it. And I just, uh, I think I briefly grazed it and then I took the uh, stock chopper in there and shredded it all up. And from that point on, the Italian ryegrass took over and, uh, and grew pretty good that year, so. John, I know we're, I'm supposed to save questions to the end, but what crop are you following when you no-tilled in that Italian ryegrass mix? Uh, so that was corn the year before, and we no-tilled into that. Oh, following after this? I think you're muted. I didn't hear the question. Or, no, no, you answered you answered oh. the question, but did you remove any of that corn, corn stover? No, just uh, the cows grazing it is all we did. Okay. okay. So the second approach we did the last two seasons was a, a multi-species. Uh, crop. We planted 12 species in the spring and uh, this is kind of the mix uh, that we used. I was told not to go over two pounds of brassicas and I have the kale collards and another brassica in there and we did two pounds but that was definitely uh, a big par portion and so in two 2020 I backed that down to six tenths of a pound total brassicas um, brassicas are a wonderful crop, but um, yeah, I, I think they were just a little bit too much in that mix. And anytime you do a multi-species crop, you really don't know exactly what you're going to get. And uh, the first grazing was primarily oats, I would say, oats and brassicas. And uh, after that, it was mainly brassicas and bursine clover. <clears throat> so, uh, but yeah, there's lots of different species. You could do different ones, but that's what we did. And and that worked pretty good. This is the same paddock and uh, the picture on the left, that is kind of the aftermath that we had after we grazed it. That was the third grazing there. Um, <clears throat> that mix, uh, like I said, it was primarily bas brassicas and bursine clover. That's really high in protein and low in fiber. And it's pretty common, I would say, in our area to have what I would call washy grass <clears throat> and uh, that's just really not a very healthy diet for a cow. It's just too extreme in the high protein, low fiber. So we decided to roll out our excess uh, spring forage of cereal rye. And uh, the first day we tried it in the middle of the field, well, that was a disaster because it was wet and the cows, you know, stomped half of it in. Then we rolled it out under the fence line. That worked better. Um, but as you can see in the picture on the right, the calves uh, go under the fence line and, and kind of were grazing. And that didn't bother me so much that they can get a little bit extra high quality feed, but they would walk right along the fence line, right over the top of the rye. And we were getting two to three inches of rain at that time. So they were kind of moving quite a bit of mud on it. And then they would sometimes get stuck in the wire when they went through and rip the fence down. So we actually went away from that and then just went to round bale feed, feeders in that field. And then we were giving the cows and calves about an acre a day. So it really slowed our rotation down and allowed us to kind of stockpile our perennial forages in the fall. And because we were having so much rain, we, we have a lot of trouble with the cows uh, muddying up a field. And an annual field like this uh, doesn't bother me so much as I didn't really want them to hurt my permanent pastures. So the third approach that we used in, uh, in that cool season mix, it, it really started off um, with the idea that I wanted to keep a living root in the soil as much as possible, which is pretty important for feeding the biology. And I didn't really wanna wait <coughs> to put my warm, or to plant anything until my 
ground was warm enough to plant my warm season crop. So I decided to go ahead and plant um, my cool season mix as soon as I could in the spring. And then I was gonna follow behind and with my corn planter and put in 30 inch rows, my warm season species. And the first two pictures on the left are from 2019. And in our area, we had a lot of rain in 2019 in the spring and it was very challenging. And by the time I got my organic corn and beans planted, I think it was like the 10th of June or something like that when I took that picture on the left. And by then the cool season crop with all that moisture was doing wonderful. <clears throat> and it was kind of a disaster, I would say, as far as the warm season crop, they just couldn't get going. And I think what happens is the soil probably was remained cool because under that canopy, uh, warm season species do best when it's 65 degrees or warmer. And that really wasn't occurring plus the competition. So in 2019, it was a disaster. I didn't get hardly anything. The picture on the right is from 2020. And that was a little bit different story because it was dry in the spring. I was able to get in earlier and plant my sorghum uh, and, and millet. But also the cool season crop really never established as well because it was so dry and didn't grow as fast. But I would say that this was, <clears throat> I guess I'm telling you that it did not work for us. I would not do it the way we did it. Um, I know one of the earlier speakers did mention about doing kind of a cocktail mix. And that's kind of where I had gotten the idea from and they planted it late May, early June. And that, that might, might work good. And, and maybe we will try that in the future. But as far as planting them separately, it's a bit risky. You'd probably have to plant your cool season crop if you're gonna do it like I did, separating it later so that you know that it doesn't get too far ahead because the, like corn, I would say even the millet and sorghums don't, they just can't compete if the, if the cool season crop has too much of a head start. So the third approach that we've done, and we've kind of evolved over time. Um, I, I believe that for cost, um, a perennial cool season uh, pasture is, is still the cheapest way to feed your cattle. Um, but I wanna be able to stockpile as much forage as I can to try to eliminate my hay feeding. Uh, because when we feed hay, the way we had calculated it out, it was about $2.80 a day to feed cows in the winter in our area. That's using our math on our farm with our rent prices and, and everything. Um, but with the grazing in the fall, uh, this is a picture on the top there with calves, but when we had uh, dry cows and we were grazing in November, December, January, we were getting about 170 cow days per acre with a single grazing event. And that worked out to $1.74, which is quite a bit cheaper than hay feeding. And so what I like about this system is that you're able to, to move so much of that forage supply into a time of the year when you don't have uh, really much pasture left. And also I would note that with the cow-calf pairs, we were getting about 150 cow-calf pairs per acre. Uh, this is something we did in 2020. <laughs> it was uh, we just a field that we grazed it, the rye twice. And then we followed with uh, that mixture shown there of sorghum sedan. Uh, that was a uh, dwarf, a brachytic dwarf a variety. Um, we put on about 7,500 gallons of dairy manure and we planted it. Um, I decided to try to graze it twice. I don't normally do that. Uh, for us, um, it was probably not the best way to do it. Um, but I just thought, I thought maybe it would get enough growth but I took off too much leaf. And I think, you know, that's important to say that if you take off too much of the leaf of the sorghum, it won't grow back quite as quick. And it's not that we didn't get a second grazing. It's just that for me, it's all about uh, profit and I need the forage in the fall to be able to extend uh, the grazing season. And that's worth more to me than what happened here is I, I grazed the sorghum, but I ended up making some hay or baleage off of some other pasture that I could have grazed. Um, and I, I feel that's less profitable than extending and pushing more of that forage back into the late part of the year. Some additional considerations about grazing cover crops. Uh, the, the picture there, the first one is a, a, a picture of our farm and all those white lines are permanent fences that we've already put in. So 
that's kind of our plan is grazing. But if you don't have that infrastructure, you're going to have to spend that to protect your crop, uh, your cash crops and your neighbors. So that's a consideration. Uh, water availability is also a very big consideration. Um, if you're just grazing in the summer, um, it's not that hard to lay out some pipe on the top of the ground and and some hoses and and have water. But in the fall, it's really challenging. Excuse me. The uh, you know things are freezing. Um, you really need to keep your water fairly close to where your cows are grazing. It's not that cows can't walk, and once the ground freezes hard, it's not an issue. They can walk a half mile or more if they need to. But in the fall, the ground is not frozen. Uh, it often rains, it's wet. Uh, the sun is not very strong and intense and it, it never really seems to dry out very well. Once it gets wet, it stays wet and the cows can really destroy everything that they walk across to go to water, go back and forth. So we've been adapting over time. Um, we used to have jug waterers and they're fine when you have about 50 cows to 80 cows, but now that we're over 200 cows, that no longer works because they each cow has to sip the water out of there. Um, so we're we're slowly putting more of these tire tanks in, and uh, that gives us more flexibility and a lot more volume of water there. Uh, another consideration is fertilizer availability. Um, if you're a dairy farmer or you have access to a lot of liquid manure or something like that, that's a consideration. Um, grasses yield more than other species. Um, However, they do need nitrogen. So sorghum and, and uh, even Italian ryegrass, they love, they love fertility. Um, I wrote on their addictions. Um, that's because uh, farming organically, we, we're tilling the soil all the time and our soils are adapted to that. That's kind of my mineral release. Um, we have a, a friend that we've done some grazing with cover crops and, and he's a no-tiller, um, regenerative cover cropping. and and that and, and his soils are used to fertilizer application and it's uh, it, in his situation um, he's done it where he didn't put fertilizer on it and the crop the cover crop didn't do as well because it's used to getting fertilizer and for us our soils are used to tillage and that's how um, we get growth and so when we no till we typically get a little less yield especially we've tried some after an oat pea mix then we've come with sorghum and we no tilled it in and I did side by side and the part where I tilled it was a foot and a half taller than the part that was not tilled. Now that doesn't mean that it's that it was advantageous to to till it because there's more considerations than just yield, but you definitely have to consider that. So lessons learned, um, I would just like to highlight that it's a cheap forage source at a time of seasonal deficiency. As we've evolved in our farming operation that to me is the critical point is, is just being able to feed hay is the least number of days a year that I can. And I think that's where um, cover crop grazing really shines for us. And that's more important than say, having some extra forage in the spring or the summer, um, but just pushing it into the fall or early winter, that's where I see the big benefit. Also in our cropping mixture, um, we've done no-till organic soybeans before and by grazing sorghum uh, in early September, we're able to come and no-till in um, rye in the fall and set ourselves up for a good no-till organic beans the next year. Um, it's hard to do that following, a, you, you really almost can't in my area, following a corn or soybean crop, it just gets to be too late. And weed control <laughs> with uh, giant ragweed. Um, I've seen much better success using like a, a rye and sorghum cover cropping mix for a couple of years than what I do if I just put the field into hay for two or three years. When I do that, as soon as I take that hay field and plow it up or whatever and put it back into corn, those ragweeds are just sitting there waiting and they just, I, it doesn't seem like it would have done any good. But by planting, um, yes, probably tilling before I put the sorghum in, the ragweeds that germinate and grow uh, can't compete with the sorghum and they you're basically getting rid of your seed supply and it just seems like I've been able to clean up fields better using cover crops than I could if I just put it in hay. And the last point is if you uh, want biology to work regeneratively breaking down minerals um, you have to leave adequate cover for them to proliferate. That is their home, it's their food source, and it's the cover for the soil to protect it. So it's really easy to scalp it clean and take everything off, but you really do need to leave some. That's pretty important too. So 
thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, uh, feel, feel free. Thank Great. you, John. I'll, I'll hold qu any questions we have here and we'll go to Jason and then we'll come back questions for you both. Um, Jason Cavadini comes to us from Wisconsin and uh, it, it's a nice, uh, Jason comes to us, he works in this area professionally, but he also does grazing cover crops at home. So um, Jason, can you share your screen? Should be coming up. You see it? Wonderful. Yep, we've got it. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Um, Hopefully I won't repeat too much that John just covered. Uh, he did a really good job of uh, kind of showing some of the different scenarios of grazing cover crops. And um, I do agree with everything that he said, but the one thing that stood out to me was uh, when he mentioned it's, it's hard to compete with a perennial system when it comes to grazing. And I think that's something that'll come through in this as well, but there are some scenarios um, where grazing cover crops still um, makes a lot of sense. So just real quick on who I am. So I'm kind of coming to you from a couple different perspectives, wearing a couple different hats. So I manage one of the ag research stations for University of Wisconsin-Madison on uh, Marshfield in the central part of Wisconsin, um, right in the heart of dairy country. I also have my own small farm with my wife and kids and we uh, raise 100% grass fed beef and direct market everything off of our farm. Um, <clears throat> the couple bottom pictures there are some aerial shots of our farm. So uh, everything is currently under perennial pasture and our cattle never come off the of pasture. So they're out there right now. Um, we bale graze through the winter. Uh, so the way I'm going to approach this presentation is sort of, uh, this is going to be a compilation of what I talk about in my role um, at the university and then also on our farm. And I'm sort of going to tell the story of the transition of our farm. So we've been here um, going on, I think, six or seven years now. We've uh, been transitioning our farm over that time. So it was under annual uh, cash crops at the time that we bought it. And um, since then, we've uh, put up fence and water infrastructure and converted everything to perennial pasture. So on uh, both of my roles, I um, kind of focus on these three things, I would say. Um, I call these the stones and the foundation of uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, so work a lot with no-till planting um, and cover crops and manage grazing um, and focus a lot on perennial crops. And so basically when we talk about regenerative agriculture, um, we're focused on continuous living roots in the soil. So um, if I didn't mention this, I'm kind of taking a step back here and just uh, covering the why of grazing cover crops. Uh, so the way that I talk about this, and I kind of struggled for a few years with how to talk about regenerative agriculture, um, and the way that I describe it now is a ladder. And so you take no-till planting, for example, that would be sort of like your entry onto this ladder of regenerative agriculture. And you have to implement other things to move up or rung on the ladder. And I really view managed grazing on perennials as higher up on the ladder. And, and what we're doing is implementing some of these other principles in order to take a few more steps up this ladder and improve soil health along the way. Um, this is an interesting photo that I wanted to share that sort of helps drive that point home. Um, we use a rainfall simulator on the research station quite a bit to demonstrate different scenarios. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but I'm going to just point out two samples. Can you see my cursor move on your screen? We can, yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. So um, this sample here on the left, so just uh, real briefly, if you haven't seen a rainfall simulator work before, 
we are able to obtain samples from different fields that are about the size of a cake pan and about the thickness of a cake pan. And we're able to get those samples without disturbing the field conditions. And then we put them side by side under simulated rainfall and we'll put an inch or two inches of rain on it. And there's two buckets for each sample. And the front bucket collects uh, runoff and the back bucket collects infiltration. And so the two samples here that I wanted to point out are this one on the far left and the one on the far right. So on the far left, this was a field that um, was not necessarily under best management practices for a long time, but um, at the end of last, at the end of 2019, we planted a rye cover crop in there in early September. And then we actually um, roller crimped that cover crop and no-tilled soybeans into it last spring. And that was a very vibrant, um, well-established, thick, dense cover crop of rye. And these samples to the right of it had all been under best management practices for several years, but did not have quite the vibrant cover crop that that did. So I really think that this sample on the left points out, and we, we pulled samples out of that all summer long. We did at least five demonstrations last summer and it performed like that consistently every single time. So that really shows the value of, of a really good cover crop. And so when we start talking about um, species selection and planting methods and timing and stuff like that, it all matters because we really want to focus on getting a crop that um, performs well because it can change things in a hurry. And really what we're trying to do with cover crops is emulate the sample on the right, which is a pasture that is a uh, mix of grass and legumes that has been under managed grazing for seven years and that's performing exactly how we would want it to. So very little sediment in the runoff after two inches of rain, very little runoff. And if you look at the infiltration, it's got less infiltration than this one on the left, even though it had the same amount of rainfall, which tells you that that ground is holding a lot more water than the rest of the samples. So that's basically a short uh, demonstration of what we're trying to achieve with these cover crops. Uh, this is from another presentation that I've been giving on regenerative egg around the winter, but the moral of this story after what I just talked about is, let's just take um, no-till planting, for example, by limit eliminating tillage is sort of entry level soil health like I showed on the ladder. Um, and we must start stacking these regenerative principles if we really want to climb that ladder towards sustained soil health. So um, no-till isn't bad by any means. We, we know the benefits of it, but we can't uh, begin to believe that it's the end all. It's just the first step on that ladder. Um, so when we start to look at these principles, um, minimizing tillage is just one of them. So how do we incorporate more of them and start stacking those principles? And that's where grazing cover crops comes into play. Um, now we're looking at stacking multiple of these by minimizing, not only minimizing soil disturbance, but keeping the soil covered um, possibly with perennial crops or with cover crops and integrating livestock onto the land. Um, so there's several different scenarios here um, for graze, to consider for grazing cover crops. Um, one John talked about quite a bit, and this is kind of what got me interested in it in the first place, extending the grazing season and limiting how much hay we need. Um, also diversifying our pastures. I put insurance on there. What I mean by that is um, we're in a pretty forgiving area here. We always have plenty of moisture, but uh, if we want to um, insure against different scenarios, if we become dry or 
um, too wet and some pastures get trampled. Sometimes it's nice to have the diversity out there to have another option to move to in some of those different situations. Um, and then also renovating perennial pastures. There are some cases and some farmers who I've talked to uh, in the past who um, want to continue improving their perennial system, but sometimes a system is so beat up from maybe being mismanaged in the past that the best approach is to start over. And sometimes cover crops give us an opportunity to do that as well. Um, and then really the big one is utilize, utilizing cover crops and annual cropping systems. Um, so real quick on my farm, I showed you that everything's under perennial pasture now, but um, for three years we get grazed cover crops as we were transitioning because I didn't want to plant the entire farm to perennial all in the same year. So we sort of had a ramp up period. And part of the reason for that was, is I was trying to determine at that time if it would make more sense for us to have a portion of our farm and annual crops. So we always had the opportunity to plant cover crops for grazing. And so we went through this three year period as sort of a case study to figure out exactly how we wanted to end up and how much we want to use cover crops. So I'll start in 2016. This was the second year that we did it. And this is when we really started tracking things a little more closely to kind of uh, compare the feasibility of this to perennials. Um, so what we did is we planted BMR sorghum Sudan grass and sold that crop. Uh, we didn't necessarily need it for grazing in the summer because we had our perennials. But then in early August, our goal was to take a diverse uh, mix of cover crop and plant it to be grazed in the fall uh, as long into the winter as possible. So the first year we did it, we had this you know big idea. We took all the seed that I could get my hands on and just made up this mix on our own. And this is what it ended up with. Well, the problem was by the time we, the, the mix looked really good and, and it worked well, but by the time I figured out exactly what it cost us, we were at $86 an acre just for the seed, which was, is very expensive. And when you start talking to farmers and trying to promote this as a potential practice for them to consider that $86 an acre is going to be a pretty big hang up. So our goal for the next year was to figure out how to get the same uh, yield or same kind of performance, which I'll get into in a few slides here, um, but cutting the cost in half at least or better. So the next year we tweaked the mix and ended up at $35 an acre, which is a little more in the ballpark of what we we're looking at. And um, what we are doing as we track the feasibility of this is we're always comparing it to the cost of hay because the alternative for us would be to not do this at all and just start feeding hay when the pastures shut down for the winter. So I'll kind of just go through the timeline of the couple of years that we tracked this and what it looked like. So things are well on their way by the end of September through October, we're not grazing. Once we get into November and things start slowing down in the perennial pasture, we started grazing. Um, and then the snow would show up in December. Um, we um, rotationally grazed this. So we gave them a new paddock every single day. Um, but then by the time we got into mid-December and we really started getting dumped on with snow, it started getting harder and harder to size paddocks correctly for a day. And so for the whole second half of December, we'd end up giving them the whole pasture. And, and then we'd get to the end of the grazing season by around the first week of January, and we'd start feeding hay. Or we'd transition from the cover crop to hay. So the overall observation for those two years was, um, our average dry matter yield over that time was about two tons per acre. We did do better than that, um, but this was an average. Um, Quality-wise, we we're looking at about 13% protein, 
very high digestibility, over 71%. Um, this stuff is rocket fuel, over 200 RFQ. Um, so generally we were grazing from about November 15th to January 1st on cover crop. Um, over that time, we fed 80% less hay than we would have. We did give a bale here and there at, for them to uh, supplement the cover crop with. Um, and we really saw the intake of the cover crop start tapering off around December 15th. Um, and then this was something else that Mary talked about quite a bit in her presentation, the trampling. Um, we figured that about a third of the cover crop was trampled. Um, so about, or I should say about two thirds of it was trampled and they only grazed about one third of it. So what the question that we were asking then at that time was what limited intake. So why did we only see a third of the cover crop grazed? And um, so what exactly was limiting our intake over that time? So if we look at quality here, um, as we track that, so this is from two different seasons, just kind of the average over time. So for beef cattle, if we're looking at somewhere in the range for RFQ of 115 to 150, uh, we were well within the range um, as that crop progressed over time. So what we were interested in is, is this losing quality so much by mid-December that they just um, stop feeding on it. And that wasn't necessarily the case based on RFQ. Um, and then if you look at protein and digestibility and TDN over that time, everything was well above um, what we're looking for for beef cattle. So what was it that was limiting our intake? And this is what, what I kind of ended up concluding. Uh, if you look at the moisture of dry hay, uh, if it's about 15% and cow needs about 30 pounds of dry matter intake per day, uh, she's gonna need to eat about 35 pounds of hay a day to meet that requirement. Well, this cover crop is about 86% moisture. Um, so to get that same 30 pounds of dry matter intake take per day, she's gonna need to eat 214 pounds of feed per day. It's gonna be pretty tough to do that. That 214 pounds of cover crop per day is about 23 gallons of water, which is twice the requirement. So I, I think, the issue was, and I'll talk about species selection a little more later, um, part of it was we were choosing cover crops that we'd seen do well in field crop scenarios, not necessarily thinking about um, how it would work in a grazing scenario. And so we ended up with a lot of these brassicas and John talked about trying to back the rate of brassicas down. These brassicas are so high in water that the cattle couldn't physically eat enough of it to get their full um, dry matter intake requirement. So some of the take homes after a couple seasons of grazing cover crops, uh, obviously intake is critical to success if you're grazing covers because they need, the whole point of doing it is for them to get their fill for them to eat it. And so they need to actually eat it for this to be successful. Um, so species selection is critical to success for intake. So like I said, if we take something that we've seen work really well in a field scenario, it doesn't necessarily translate to working perfectly in grazing. Um, species uh, should be selected uh, in planting, species and planting date. Um, should be selected to achieve a range of maturities and palatability. Uh, so you don't want everything to be like those brassicas that are very high uh, in water content. Um, you do want some to actually progress more on the end of maturity than some of the others. Um, mixes should be designed and seeding rates should be designed to be cost-effective compared to feeding hay, uh, which is kind of what we're 
been talking about the whole time. Um, and I think the big thing to remember, um, especially as cover crops have taken off in popularity and it, it's intriguing to think about grazing them, but I, I do think it's important to sometimes stop and really compare the feasibility to a well-managed perennial pasture. And there's a lot of times where they might not be, where grazing covers might not be more feasible than a perennial pasture. However, um, grazing cover is, is pretty easy to justify in an annual or row crop scenario, especially where someone already has the cover crop. So if you can take it the next step by figuring out how to get the livestock out there, you're gonna start translating some of that in the profit. Um, and I really think early seeding will help benefit yield and quality. And that's where inner seeding of row crops comes in because you're able to get it planted in a more timely manner. And I know that there's some challenges with that that I'll uh, address in a second, but also alternative rotations. So basically setting up the entire crop rotation to allow or to accommodate for grazing of cover crops. Um, so now uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of interest in wide row or 60 inch row corn. And so we uh, started a trial with our local watershed group last year at four sites across North Central Wisconsin, one of them being the research station. Uh, with the goal of maximizing cover crop growth in interceding scenarios enough that the cover crop is something substantial to be grazed at the end of the season. Um, so we had across these four sites, 30 inch corn and 60 inch corn. This was the average um, popul corn populations in both of those. And you can kind of see how those compared in dry matter yields. So by going down to 60 inch rows, you are sacrificing a little bit of dry matter tonnage in the corn silage, um, but you are making gains in corn silage quality. And this is sort of an interesting phenomenon that we've been seeing for three or four years now, where when there is an interseeded cover crop, the quality of the corn silage is significantly greater consistently. Um, and then the other thing we achieved by widening out those corn rows is more cover crop biomass. Um, basically a 340% increase across these four sites um, by widening out those corn rows. Um, and then also you can see the cover crop quality is greater where we had the wider rows. Um, this there's a lot here and I'm not going to go through everything. This is the same as uh, what I showed earlier with the rainfall simulator. In fact, I'll go to here. So we've been tracking uh, soil health uh, in some different, uh, with our watershed group in some different scenarios um, using one soil health tool. And so if I go back to these samples from the rainfall simulator and we focus on those two outside ones again, and then you start looking at some of the soil health uh, scores from those. It's just another example of what we're able to achieve by having a vibrant, uh, well-established cover crop, which would be represented here in sample number seven. So if you look at the respiration and the microbial active carbon, and then the overall soil health score. So basically this respiration is a indicator of biological activity. Um, so there's our, our vibrant um, cereal rye cover crop, and then here's our managed grazing. Um, you can see how they stack up to some of these other scenarios, which just re-emphasizes why we're trying to keep continuous living cover and livestock on the land. Um, and then this is, I've had this in the end of some of my presentations this winter, so I left it in here, but just couple more anecdotes. These are two pictures that I had in my phone from last season. So often I'll get 
a couple of these questions. Why all the focus on soil health and soil conservation? Um, this picture here on the right is from a small uh, landscaping project that I did at my home where I removed the uh, top soil and then I had a two five gallon buckets of the subsoil and I needed somewhere to go with it and there was a low spot against the foundation of my house so I threw it there back in the spring of 2019. This picture was from September of 2020. So this sample has gone for over a year, a year and a half, uh, without sprouting even one single weed. And this is the subsoil. And I see farms in our area uh, where the subsoil is starting to become evident um, when they do their spring field work. So that should be concerning to us. Um, to see it, how productive that subsoil is in relation to the topsoil and um, should emphasize how important it is to protect our topsoil. And then another picture here is from an area where we got wet during the earlier in the grazing season and a water tank sat here and this area got plowed up by the cattle and then barnyard grass came back in and filled in the area and it was green all summer long. But then in October, when we were still grazing on our perennial pasture, this is most, mostly meadow fescue, the barnyard grass uh, went away. It petered out on us. And so um, I think this really emphasizes why species selection is so important. I've had a lot of, cup, a lot of farmers say, well, I've got barnyard grass growing between my corn rows. Why would I waste time interseeding cover crops? Well, because some of these things that move in as weeds are opportunists. And as soon as the going gets tough, they're gonna go away. Um, but you look at the meadow fescue and it's still working hard for us. So I just really think that uh, species selection is maybe more important uh, with cover crops than what we've thought before. So, um, and then I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but um, you know the, the big thing to remember is when we're talking about regenerative principles that these practices can be profitable or unprofitable depending who you're talking to. And I think the same goes with grazing cover crops. Um, we really have to be diligent in figuring out how they apply on our own operation. And just because it works on an operation down the road doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be feasible for us. Um, so that is where I'll leave it and I'm not sure where we're at for time if there's time for questions but. I'll... Yes we do have a few minutes um, for questions and uh, John and Jason if you'd both like to address these. Um, so there's been a little discussion going on in the, in the chat box, which you guys can all read about grazing the rye and Mary's had some, some insights from her work. Um, Kate has a question, how many, well, Rachel, excuse me. So how frequently would you recommend rotating grazing cover crops into a cash crop rotation? Uh, I, you know, I would say that depends on your context. Uh, I've done it every other year and work. I mean, obviously the more forage you have in there for weed control, the, the better your cropping will be, but you have to economically decide what's best for you. And John, what prevents you from doing it every year? Is it just the length of growing a corn crop that prevents that? Of, of doing a cover crop every year? Yes. Well, if I was going to do a cover crop every year, I, I would just do a perennial instead. Yeah, I think it's... So you're talking about rotating a full season cover crop in your cash crop system? Uh, yes, I was. As you were describing. That's, that's what I thought the question was. Yes. Yeah, okay. no, um, you can do, I mean, we do cover crops pretty much every year that we can. If, if we harvest in November, we, <clears throat> we might not plant rye, but we often do. So we are putting a cover crop in, but if it's planted too late, we probably won't be able to graze it if we're going, say, from corn to soybeans right. and plant rye in and, and uh, you know, the spring, it, it just is enough growth that we'll just till it under and plant the next crop. 
so John, can you describe that rotation there where every other year you're using a full season of and grazing annuals? Your well, yeah, I mean, if we're say raising corn and then I'll go in with a full season, uh, cool season crop and graze that either, whether it be Italian ryegrass or a multi-species crop, we'll graze it several times that year. And then the next year it can go back into either corn or a soybean or some other crop. So we just, that's our home farm has fences all over the place. And so it's very easy for us to take, uh, take a year or two off and graze and then go back into crops. Or, originally I had set up my, my idea that I was gonna rotate uh, my pastures maybe for three years of pasture and then go into crops. The problem I had <clears throat> was what I sort of mentioned about the cows uh, pugging it up if you seed it down. Um, if your pastures are new, they, they're not as good as when they're five or 10 years old. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just saw too much damage when I was seeding in that system. So, but now with less tillage, um, it would probably do better. Great, thank you. Uh, um, to go back to that question, um, and this maybe isn't really an answer to the question as much as it's an aside, but the reason why I, on my own operation, don't graze cover crops anymore is because I started stockpiling my perennial pastures. So um, a few years ago, I was raising my own herd and also custom grazing dairy heifers and I got overstocked and learned the hard way how stressful it is to be overstocked and vowed to never do that again. So now I err on the side of staying understocked. And what that allows me is the opportunity to stockpile my perennial pastures. And what I've learned since I started doing that is I can get just as far into the winter by stockpiling my perennials as I could with a cover crop. So now I've just decided that it really makes no sense to, for me anyway, to rotate out the perennial pasture just to grow a cover crop. So I really think when you're talking about rotating a cover crop in for grazing, I think it's in more of an annual row crop system. Great. Gentlemen, thank you both so very much. Great presentations and great to hear about what you're doing. We are, we are out of time for our session. And thank you also for those of you who commented in the chat box. Um, 